Well, you folks who have come to enjoy part of the Walter Durham lecture series. Um, when Walter Durham died, there were so many people who appreciated what he did as our state historian, and of course the 24 books he wrote. <coughs> but he was the chairman of the fundraising committee so that we could have this library because he raised funds that were matched by the city and the county. So we are taking some of the money of the memorials to give as honorariums to people who participate in our lecture series. And this is the third season for our series, which we have every spring and fall. So uh, I will introduce our speaker, who is Chris Thurman. The last time I saw this young man was um, a very long time ago. That's fine. I'm not on a soccer field, I was either a coach or a referee, and this guy has got some legs. <laughs> so he grew up here in Gallatin and went to Gallatin High School. He is very familiar with our community, and he has been with the Tennessee State Park System since <coughs> May of 2014. He began his career at Bledsoe Creek State Park as an SIR. Anyone know what that is? Well, okay. A seasonal interpreter. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. A seasonal interpretive ranger. <laughs> and yes, the hat, which he says is heavy and stiff. But he looks so handsome in it. Yeah, that's, that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> okay. Um, after he was a seasonal interpretive ranger, um, he then went into conservation there at the park. He had an opportunity to become a ranger at Long Hunter State Park and went there and worked in that capacity at Long Hunter for two and a half years before being named our new manager of Bledsoe Creek State Park. Now you're going to be impressed. <laughs> he has three degrees. One in biology, one in secondary education, and a third in environmental geology. In the two former degrees, which he received from Tennessee Wesleyan University, and the Last one he received as a graduate of Tennessee Technological University. <coughs> he also holds a Tennessee teaching license with an endorsement in biology. So this man knows the property that he is walking around and can tell you what the flowers are and the trees are and all about the history of the state park. So. Without further comment, I will introduce Chris Thurman. Thank you guys. Thanks for some because I didn't realize that she was going to be saying all of that. I, she stole a little bit of my thunder, but yeah, every bit of that is actually true, including the soccer bit. So uh, uh, yeah, growing up, I thought I was going to be some kind of professional soccer player and then figured out real quick that that's not an easy thing to come by. So um, yeah, that's exactly where I've been. And, and prior to that, I taught high school sciences for about 12 years and then uh, boom, here we are. So uh, I started back as the park manager uh, last summer, July 2nd, was my first day back at work, so to speak. So um, since there, uh, just lots of different initiatives we're trying to get uh, on board and accomplished. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it as we go through the slideshow here, but essentially we have what we call the peak season. We're getting ready to really ramp up, but officially at our park out here at Bledsoe, it starts March 1. And the reason why that is is because peak season runs from March 1 to December 1. And then the back half, including primitive, which I'll show you here shortly, gets shut down. And basically it's just a uh, conservation efficiency mode. Um, we don't have enough demand on the one park road that stays open for 24-7 year-round camping to open up the rest of the park. But if ever we got to that point, we would definitely open up the remainder of the park and get that going. So uh, I am in Area 3. 
uh, out of six different areas that uh, go across all state parks, and there's a total of 56 state parks. Um, so what we always start out with in my area manager meetings is the park mission, Tennessee State Park Mission to be specific. So uh, that gets read to me, and I will read it to you. To preserve, protect, and perpetuity, unique examples of natural, cultural, and scenic areas, and provide a variety of safe, quality, outdoor experiences through a well-planned and professionally managed system of state parks. Now, you will find underneath ours, underneath that one, ours, Bledsoe Creek State Park Mission, which is, uh, if you look at it, very similar. This is something I just recently came up with. Uh, we have always had one, and I found two versions in my desk drawer to the right of me, left by former manager, Mr. Rick Brooks. And uh, it was probably about another three or four lines longer than that. And if anybody's ever worked or had a job where you had a mission, a mission statement specifically, it's supposed to be short and sweet and to the point. So when you have eight lines of things to remember and spit out at your visitation, <laughs> it's not very uh, productive. So I came up with this and submitted it to my uh, boss, and uh, he sent it up the chain, and I got approval. So this one's straight to the point uh, to preserve and promote the natural, historical, and educational, that was a key word of mine, aspects of Bloodstone Creek State Park while offering enriching camping and day use experiences. So when I interviewed for my position that I'm in now, I said Bloodstone Creek really offers two major things. That's water access, being on Old Hickory, and also the camping aspect. And those are the two things that I want to try to enhance and make better out there. Um, so along those lines, and we'll get into it a little later, um, we, we're going to look into some watercraft rental opportunities. Even when I was there as a seasonal, I thought it odd that well, here we are, we have two major boat ramp put-ins and a third courtesy dock, and people light it up with their own personal watercraft, but we don't offer anything from the park. So there's two things going on there. Um, uh, when I was there as a seasonal, there was this old beat down pontoon that stayed up in the corner of the maintenance area and I would walk by it every day. And finally I just asked, what's going on with the pontoon boat? They said, ah, the friends group, basically one of the a couple in the friends group owned that and then the friends group bought it from them and they were gonna take tours on it. Well, no one wanted to ride that boat in the condition that it was in. So I offered to revamp it and strip it down and build it up and that's exactly what I did going from my seasonal uh, summer on into the maintenance affair. And uh, when I left there to go to Longhunter State Park, it was running, driving, functional boat, and now it's kind of in a state of disrepair. So one of the uh, initiatives I plan on getting to, uh, hopefully by the end of the summer, maybe before the end of the summer, is getting that boat back up and functional to take, you know, $5, $10, whatever, tours out on the, on the water and do interpretive programming from the boat. Um, the other thing, and I've got a slide that I'll show you, is. Uh, an opportunity called Paddle EZ. Uh, Paddle EZ is a uh, setup that is meant to be non-manned. That's my problem out there at the park. There are five people that are paid to work there with an additional either four or six campground hosts, which are volunteer efforts. They are not paid. So uh, my problem is manning a boathouse, manning a boat station. Um, so this is a setup that is uh, very much like the camping reservations themselves. You go uh, online to a website. You uh, submit how, what day and what hour uh, you want to try to pick up the boat, and it's so much per hour. And it's all set up. It gives you a PIN number. You show up on site <laughs> into the digital keypad, and you get your boat, and off you go. And uh, our only responsibility is to kind of go around and check the equipment once a week to make sure everything's accounted for. So uh, there's the park mission, and uh, skip ahead a little bit. But here is uh, kind of the layout of where we came from. So Bledsoe Creek State Park was developed as a recreational area by the Corps. Uh, I actually did my senior thesis uh, as far as the environment, environmental geology out there. Um, so if you're looking at the park map, which we'll have up in a minute, over here to the uh, right-hand border, uh, the eastern border, there's a series of real, reels and gullies, as we call them in geology, and uh, they're very entrenched, they're very engorged. And the deal is, how did they get so entrenched and engorged? with this giant stand of forest. So I went to the USDA department over here on the other side of town um, and got the historical photos, aerial photos, and kind of looked at it. So what is there now is what we call a climax community. So the old homesteads that used to be there, you had plowing and farming and disking and things of that nature, and so that kept the ground broken up. Therefore you had erosion, therefore you had the gullies and rills formed way before the forest ever got there. It's called the universal soil loss equation or the revised universal soil loss equation. I have this giant picture, and a big, long, drawn-out deal for my senior thesis. So, uh, through all that research, I figured out that the Corps began this project in the mid-50s and finished it in the late 50s. 
and dammed up the river. And then later on, it officially became Tennessee State Park in 1973, which uh, all state parks now have a uh, matching uh, uniform, as they call it, entryway sign with the cedar log across the top, and we'll have the date inscribed on there as well. So if you visit other state parks, you'll see a uniformativity uh, sign up front giving you the, the date, uh, sorry, the year that it was established. And then lastly, a little bit about the park itself. So uh, it's 169 acres, it used to be 165, I know that's minimal difference, but uh, basically the, the Corps donated a few more water acres to us, so it went up to 169 in the last few, um, last few years. So it's a lease deal. It's a Corps engineer property that we lease as Tennessee State Park. So that's oftentimes confused as to whether we're Corps or whether we're state. It is Corps property that is leased by the state. So uh, the, the major interaction or discussion I have with that is about the carrying permits. So uh, it used to be within the last couple of years that, get my sequence of events here. You couldn't carry on state parks. Then you could carry on state parks not owned by the court because federal law trumps state law okay so for for a short few years federal lands governed by federal lands could not be carried on so where i was at is long hunter state park on percy priest that's also core engineer so you couldn't carry there um but you go to uh let's go with uh, standing stone for example they have no core interaction you could carry there so uh, in the last little bit, the last few years, you now have to have your state issued carrying permit just like anybody would have. And then you've got to go to the core office and get their carrying permit. So if you were to show up at my park carrying a weapon, you would have to show me two pieces of paper, two certifications uh, uh, showing a carry permit from the core as well as from the overall state. So uh, that's a little bit about the park itself. Um, Historical significance, so we do a lot of programming out there. Uh, we've got a particular trail now that's been really coming along the last few years. I was there uh, where the fur trading cabin was getting built there in the, kind of the middle of this trail. So essentially what you have is a quarter mile trail with six stations. It begins in roughly in the 1500s, which is kind of dictated there in that first paragraph, and ends in the late 1700s, early 1800s with the homestead. Um, so again, if you guys are familiar at all with the area out here, you know you've got a lot of surrounding amenities. When people come into the office, I tell them, Bledsoe Creek State Park in and of itself is not super historical, but there's a lot of surrounding amenities that are, so Cragfont, Wynwood, uh, Hawthorne Hill, all those things, which are our office lobby, and we'll show you some slides of that shortly. But that's what this is talking about here. You had the uh, <coughs> salt lick there down the road that was uh, good for drawing in the game. When you had game drawn in, then you had the hunters drawn in, et cetera, et cetera. So you had a lot of the... Uh, Indian territory there, and then you had uh, the Bledsoe brothers, Anthony and Isaac, come in, and, and there was oftentimes war and scalping and things of that nature. The fort, obviously, Bledsoe Fort, right down the road. So, a lot of important and historical things going on around the park within a short drive, and it's good for people to come there that aren't familiar with the area or not from around here. They'll set up their camp there with us, and they'll go out and explore the local amenities and that kind of thing. So, that's kind of what will happen in the area back in those times. And then uh, in the last few years, it used to be just a, pretty much just a camping destination. And the day use aspect has really come along in the last few years. Mainly ever since I've been there as a seasonal is when it's kind of started really ramping up. Uh, it was kind of like Sumner County's best hidden gym kind of thing. So uh, the hiking trails themselves, uh, roughly six miles or so. Uh, what we have there in the top left, that's our state uh, naturalist. His name is Randy Hedgepath. If you want to put this in your notes, he'll be out to the park on April 14th. This guy can walk past anything that is living, be it a plant, be it an animal, you name it. If you point at it, he can tell you what it is. He is a wealth of information, by far the best naturalist that I've ever seen in action. And uh, the coolest thing about Mr. Hedgepath is that he's not just an encyclopedia with that type of attitude. He has flair, he, he ups, up, lowers and raises his tone, and he tells a story while he's going along his hike. So if at all you have a possibility, come out and check him out on April 14th. Um, you can find the exact time on our website. Um, he'll be there, and it's a rare occasion to get him out. He visits, he visits all 56 state parks, and so to get him on site is a, is a real treat. So he'll be out there coming up. Bottom left, which you can maybe make out, is that's me. And this is about 87 people, if I remember right, that showed up for the New Year's Day hike. So the idea is you kick off the new year right and you come out for your first first day of the year hike. 
So uh, we had some dogs in the picture, and I believe there was, um, again, about 87 people there for that. Uh, major event, and uh, basically what I did was I took the tour of the park with them. Uh, that, if you recall back to the first of the year, much like February as well, super flooded, lots of rain. So where we were going to go, which is called the Shoreline Trail, uh, was underwater in many, many parts. Uh, there might have been six, eight foot of it that was out of water. So I deviated from the plan and, and made the best of it, and everybody seemed to have a good, a good time with it. We actually ended up going on Tennessee History Trail, which actually runs right in here. We haven't quite got it on these maps. It is available on our campground map, which is going to come up on another slide. But there's your key up there, the different colors and whatnot, and, uh, the different hiking trails. So something new that I got going here, an initiative that uh, I'm pushing throughout the, the whole park, and my rangers heading this up, is the trail blazings, we call these blaze, blazes. Um, so this is polycarbonate, and this is gonna be a six inch trailhead marker, which will be followed by ones that look just like it that are three and a half inches. And these will be laid out along the trail, the big ones to be marking the trailhead. And uh, so what's out there now, for the fact that it loops in several places, there's a loop here, and there's some places that cross over, like this is actually two trails in that area there. So it gets a little confusing, and it's always been confusing, even when I was a seasonal, then I was in the maintenance, and I've devised a few plans along the way in both of those capacities to try to make it easier discerned. So this is, this is gonna happen this time, now that I'm back as the manager. So we've got these, and they're all in the appropriate colors that you see up in the key, and we'll get those out. Uh, one trail, known as the Birdsong Trail, which is about a half mile trail, um, over here to the public launch, it's this one right here. That one is already done, it is orange in color, and looks really good, we've got a lot of good compliments on it lately. And then these, if you really like them, to keep you from plucking them off the trees, <laughs> you, can, you can have these in the gift shop, they're, they're four bucks. People love to get them for like uh, stocking stuff or you know, things like that. Keep people from tampering with them that are placed out on the trail. Um, so, there is the hiking trail map in itself, and I have those up here in a rip-off, so if you're interested in going on with one tonight, just come out and rip one of these off. Here's the pad. Okay. Alright, so fishing and boating, as I alluded to earlier, we basically had three boat ramps. This is what we used to call the public boat launch, I guess we still kind of refer to it that way. Public in the fact that the one on the back, which is this one, back of the park, used to be set aside and only reserved for campers. So uh, something that my former uh, boss, the predecessor to my position now, uh, Mr. Rick Brooks, got put in place, he allowed this to be open to everyone. So we now have two public launches, if you follow my drift. So this one, I actually, uh, I think it was the 2010 flood, that one got ripped away and went away. Nobody ever found it. So it was a while before they got it rebuilt and put back in place, so that one is on the back side. This one is a cross for maintenance and what we call the public launch, and then this is our courtesy dock here. Um, that happens to be my clerk's little boy fishing in the courtesy dock. And then the kayak thing we threw in there because the kayaks are coming up in the form of Paddle Easy, hopefully, has recently been bit out anytime you go to an operation like this on a park um, grounds. You've got to have uh, three bids um, or attempt to have three bids. And so we're waiting for that to get through the paper and get the uh, results of what the uh, bidding process is. All right, and then another popular thing now at the park is birding. Uh, like we said, we have the bird song trail. Uh, this in the top is an eastern bluebird, okay? And so the conservation worker prior to me taking that job, his name is Bill Wheeler, and he stayed on as a campground host for quite some time. And matter of fact, they were there when I got back as the manager last summer, and they've since taken off to visit other pastures, so to speak. But he was responsible for getting a huge influx of the eastern bluebird into the park. They take a certain size hole for their bird boxes, and he built tons of them dozens of them, and put them around the park, and we had a giant influx of that particular uh, species. Um, top left over there is going to be the red-tailed hawk. Bottom left is a non-breeding mallard, male, and the uh, great blue heron here, which is one of the awesome creatures you find out at the park. Uh, they make a very peculiar noise. Anybody know that noise? I do. Yeah. yeah. So if you're not expecting it, you sneak up on one and he takes flight. <laughs> so uh, don't let us sneak up on it. And then this is my ranger here, Jennifer Smith is her name. And uh, this is a, a birding program that she puts on where she does some bird calls on her phone. They walk around, they pick 
picked them out of a, a poster on the wall there, and that's the conference room. Actually, that's the lobby. Conference room is over here. But at the end of it all, they get a, a birdhouse to take on with them, and sometimes she has a different sort of workshop, and she'll have them paint them and that kind of thing. But uh, it's a very popular program. Uh, people like to bring out their kids to learn a little bit about birding itself, and then they get to go home with something. Everybody loves to get to go home with something. <laughs> so that's what you can find as far as birds. And, you know, this isn't everything. we got great white egrets as well that hang out with the blue herons, um, and also the woodpeckers. We have the pileated woodpecker out there, uh, the grandest and biggest of the woodpeckers, and, and they th make a certain sound. Kind of sounds like uh, the, the Predator, if you recall that movie, Orange <laughs> They make that racket as they fly through the air. Um, wildlife viewing. So everybody always walks into the office and says, hey, what kind of animals do you see out here? And so the three critters I always give them are the white-tailed deer, the wild turkey, and the gray squirrel. So I've got all three of them up here. Um, can you see other things? Of course, I just had some of them on the previous slide. But uh, the white-tailed deer, there's uh, certain couples. They're obviously retirees. They drive through, and they have a clicker. And that's what they do. They drive through and they click how many deer they see every day. And it's like a little game for them. And they just, you know, I don't know if they're trying to beat their number or whatnot, but every day they have a number and sometimes I'll catch them, you know, I'll step out of the office and they'll be passing by and I'll, I'll step out, hey, what do we got today? How many? You know, they'll, they'll give me a number. So they come out and count them and that's how many there are. Uh, growing up around here, seeing a deer is not a norm for me, but you'd be surprised how many people come to the park and they're just fascinated. So I'll be making a patrol in the park, and I'll come up behind somebody. And I know immediately if they're just parked in the road, that on either side of the road are deer. <laughs> and so I'll look out, and sure enough, I'll just stand a deer over there. <coughs> Wait. Wait. And they got out their cameras, and they take a picture. And so every now and then, if it's, you know, I'll just cruise around, and I'll wave and say hi. But the deer are very popular. Uh, wild turkey uh, obviously come through in droves. But what I want to point out here, this is a before and unfortunately after picture. So at the beginning of the summer, uh, well, I guess late fall actually, now I'm thinking about it. Uh, we had uh, four chicks. Can you pick them out? Four albino chicks. Mm -hmm. One, two, mm -hmm. three, four. Okay. And uh, so everybody loved the albino chicks. You know, people come in the office about the animals, and I'd say, oh yeah, we got some wild turkey running around with some albino chicks in the clan. And so this was probably two weeks, three weeks ago maybe. This is on Ziegler's Ford headed back out to the main drag out here. Park is back here. And there's one lone albino left. And he's grown to adulthood, uh, young but still adult. And uh, so he's still with them. And it's, it's very odd that these guys would live at all, uh, particularly into young adulthood. And uh, you know, he, he still may not live the full life as the rest of them in the picture. But the fact that he's made it this far, I wanted to include that in the slideshow. And, uh, of course, these guys, I don't know if we have any fans in here, but they wreak total havoc at the park. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Um, at least twice a year, uh, Park Parr and his, his uh, patrol vehicle, which used to sit there at the residence, if, if you're familiar with the park, the residence there, he used to inhabit that. And uh, they would eat the fuel lines and cause a lot of damage as far as you know, time and money to get it fixed. So even though they're cute and all, they cause a lot of problems. Um, I haven't had any problems yet, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's only a matter of time. The campground hosts have had some damage over the years, so while they run about and they're fun to watch, they can sometimes be a pest. So that's the typical wildlife you might see out there. Here's our camping map, uh, similar to the hiking map, only in this version you get to see the numbers that are associated with the various uh, sites. Here's primitive, something I'm very proud of, and here's the new addition as far as the Tennessee History Trail kind of parallels the main road there. So uh, in brief, what you have here is the red are going to be the premium sites as we refer to them, uh, meaning that they come with 50, 30, and 20 amp service as far as electricity, mm -hmm. so they're going to cost the most. Numbers 8 through 15 are right here, as well as 52 through 57. You cannot apply discounts to those, but the rest of them you can, so just keep that in mind if you want to come out and visit. Um, these in yellow are going to have 30 amp and lower service. Um, there are a couple of them that have had to have the power towers replaced over the years and they've been upgraded to the 50 amp. But in general, this is a cheaper price and I have a, a list up here in case you're interested as far as prices across the park. Um, so this is going to be cheaper because of the lower amperage. And then lastly, this is our cheapest option. The primitive sites there are $11 plus tax. Um, this is something I did right before I left to go to Long Hunter State Park. Um, this was all woods through here. 
And what we decided to do, TDOT has been instr instrumental in helping me then, as well as now. Um, they came in with a D9 dozer and cleared all that. And so now we have a connecting one-way road that runs in this direction. And so everything on the right, and I'll have a picture of it here shortly. Everything on the right was made back in 2015 and, and got online. Well, it wasn't online, which is key. Um, it was made available. You had to walk in and do those sites. So um, as I started back as manager, I, I wanted to mirror that on the other side. And that is now in place as far as the pull-throughs. What is not depicted here, this is like a little off-skirts. This is actually for pull-throughs, which will look just like these pull-throughs when it's all said and done and they have power and water on them. So down the road, the idea is to get amenities to these primitive sites and they will become just like the rest. Um, they have little dividers in between them right now and those will get pulled up and you'll have a pull through. So um, that's what's going on with camping. We do have two group camp areas. Um, doesn't really have to be nonprofit, um, but that's kind of what that leans towards. We have church groups come in, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, things of that nature. Those can be had and again, the price list is up here. What is in purple is what we call our day use area. Um, you got a big playground that uh, become confusing over the years because originally it was the old playground and this up here was the new playground. The new equipment got put down here along the old playground. So um, it's just the big playground. Is how I call it. The playground down in day use or the big playground is how we refer to that. So um, lots of things to do if you're out just for a day or if you want to camp. Um, again, this is the back boat ramp public boat ramp, now both open to the public, courtesy dock, even though it's not depicted, lies right in here, kind of where the fishing uh, icon is at. So, that's what's going on with camping. We do offer a laundry facility, if you're interested, down here in your maintenance. Um, this is depicting, actually that is primitive right there. So primitive has a picnic table, firing and grill, and it's right along the water, which makes it really nice, and that is just one of our back end sites. It's like, 57 perhaps. Okay. Day use area. We just talked a little bit about that. So um, this is a kiosk that used to be located elsewhere. So we've just got it moved to make it better outfit. There's a what we call the four-way intersection right behind the VC. And so there used to be a little 500 square foot shack. Anybody remember that shack that used to be the visitor's office? It was terrible. <laughs> there was as many squirrels occupying that as there was actual employees. Um, so when that got knocked down and the woods behind it cleared out to make the parking area as well as the uh, footprint for the new uh, BC, uh, that, that was kind of misplaced. And so I recently got it put somewhere where it would be more informative for people getting out of their vehicles and hitting the trails. This is actually the new playground up on Rabbit Jump back towards the, the rear of the park. Our picnic area there in day use, uh, which is right in front of what we call the stage. The stage uh, used to be called Bo's Picking Place for Wayne Bomar, who used to be a former manager there. Um, and so it's kind of now coming <coughs> towards an outdoor classroom. So we'll be holding class out there and uh, school groups that come, come get a whiteboard out there, things of that nature. So you can hang up stuff, draw stuff, things of that nature. Um, but that's what we offer in the way of day use. Um, dog friendly atmosphere, so uh, I myself do not have any children. We have what my wife refers to as fur babies. So those are my two fur babies in the top left there. That's one day I, I taught them off near the Long Hunter half shelter when I was actually working at Long Hunter because I was going to build one of those structures over there. So I was taking pictures and all, so I tied them up for a moment. This is uh, more of the New Year's Day hike and there was a few dogs along on that one as I mentioned. These are some kids running down in primitive. Dogs on a leash. The main point you need to get across here is the fact that all of these things, including the piggy, are on leashes. So that, that's right outside the VC. And uh, to be honest with you, I can't remember whose that is, but I definitely wanted to have a picture of that. I wanted to make sure I included that. So dog friendly atmosphere, and uh, you'd be amazed the night and day difference between Long Hunter State Park and, and our park out here. Um, most everybody obeys the rules and runs for manners, and I really, really appreciate it because it wasn't always the case at Home Hunter State. <laughs> and uh, most part, people keep their dogs on leashes, but I want to make sure that everybody realizes that we're dog friendly. Those are on the leashes. Uh, the shelters. This one is actually, uh, well, they're both in day use, but this one is the one you would come to first. It's the smaller of the two shelters, known as Shelter One. That one is meant to occupy and, and hold, I should say, uh, 30 people. This one is meant to accommodate 100 people, and it's got the fireplace here. There is a fire ring in behind this one, um, and again, 75 and 125, if I'm not mistaken, 
for the rentals on those. And uh, you can have this whole thing uh, as far as the parking lot. There's a gate over here that will be gated off, and you can have you know your entire family park in there and make use of that facility. So that is also located in day use. Boardroom, this is really cool. So the boardroom is neat. It's got its own little fireplace. It's got a giant TV in it. Nobody ever uses it. I've had the first group come in and occupy it. Um, it was actually a sister entity, uh, Air Pollution Control, came in and used it uh, last week, I believe. Um, so I gave it to them on the house because they were the first occupants. Um, but yeah, so it's got your big table here. The sides fold down if you want. Um, and all this has your HDMI cable, uh, all your data hookups, so you can run a laptop right there in the middle of the table if you like. But good for small business meetings and things of that nature. And again, so if you're looking at the VC, this is off to the left, and the lobby is off to the right there. So uh, something that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. So if you know somebody that has a small business or something like that, um, that's kind of what's geared toward. We'd rather not rent it out for birthday parties and have cake stomped into the carpet, so <laughs> we kind of reserve it for you know business groups and things of that nature. How much? Uh, Seventy-five dollars, if I'm not mistaken, sir. Are those rates per day per hour? Uh, good question. Seventy-five dollars, yes, sir. And um, yes, yeah, so what we do is uh, the office is open for business. Who asked? Eight o'clock and closes at four thirty. So I think we set it up nine to three. Somewhere along those lines. I mean, we're willing to work with you, of course, but we want to be able to open up the building and get it all set up for you and then be able to have time to clean up and close it. So, nine to three, I think, is the typical range that we allow the conference room. And as far as the shelters, yes, that's a daily thing. So, if uh, it's first come, first serve to the shelters, let me point that out. But let's say you look ahead and you want to have your family reunion there or something and it's set up for July 1 or whatever then the night before the tags we printed up, we slotted your name into uh, a holder on the gate. Mm -hmm. The gate will be shot at, shut Excuse me, at the end of that night, and it's, and it's yours for the following day, so you can get there as soon as the gate comes up, which is 6 a.m., mm -hmm. and you'll need to be out uh, this time of year, 7. I'll talk about that real briefly. So we have a security gate, and there's a slide coming up for it, but uh, we finally decided, <laughs> my campground host kind of go back and forth on this, and, and when, when the law enforcement goes home, it's kind of on them. So that's the whole reason why the security gate was put in, and that was put in by my former uh, boss, Mr. Brooks, because um, it's just me and a ranger, and a lot of parks have two or three rangers, five or six rangers. So we're kind of low, low staffed as far as that aspect goes. But so um, they used to stagger like four, five, six, seven, we're reprogramming the uh, gate all the time. So now we finally decided on five and seven. So it's gonna be five in the off season, and seven in the peak season, even though it obviously gets dark closer to 8.30 at its latest. So seven o'clock is when the gate will come down and you'll have to have a gate code to get in. And all campers are given a gate code to get in. Good questions. Anything else? On this thing. Okay. Uh, so I referenced the residents earlier. Uh, we had a ranger living in this. Paul Ernest used to live in this with his family. And when he vacated, when Jennifer took uh, his position, it was offered to her, and she lives up in Portland and, and declined. Uh, I discussed it with my wife, but we, we had too much going on in our property, which isn't too far away. So it's going to now be a wedding venue. So uh, if you know anybody that's interested in this and that, my uh, clerk is currently typing up the rhetoric to go along with it, basically what are you going to get for this amount of money kind of thing. Um, so. You know, after Paul moved out, it had a lot of work, a new roof, painting on the outside, the deck was redone. So uh, what we currently offer, in case you didn't know, they impressed upon all state parks to try to create a wedding venue. Go out and look in your park and find some place that a wedding might like to be at. That's not always, you know, something doesn't automatically just jump out of you in some of these state parks. So what we have was along what we call the uh, Raccoon Creek Waterfront which is the title of the day use road, Raccoon Creek. And it just was confusing and not easily understood as to what you were getting, et cetera, et cetera. You can't keep the public out of there, really, because you can't block off trails. So it just was not user friendly. So when this came up, as many of you know, if you don't occupy or live in a house, it kind of goes down, so something needs to happen with it. So I brainstormed for a while after I got back as manager, and I decided, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be intended for a wedding venue. A uh, wedding party can come in and, and have it for a day, or the night before, and or the night before and after, depending on whatever price you're willing to pay, that kind of thing. 
So still in the works, but down the road, that's what that will be set up to become. Uh, and then here we are back at the VC. Uh, this is my clerk, Ashley. Um, I was informed when I was getting ready to prepare to interview for this job that said clerk three uh, that used to be with us had already put in her notice and would be quitting uh, later on. <laughs> okay. So um, I hired this young lady in September, September 17th, if I'm not mistaken, was her first day. And uh, she's really good at her job. She's probably overqualified, super sweet on the phone. She can answer any of your questions. She's a quick learner. She's learned a great deal about the office and all the paperwork and things that must run through the office in her short time. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, this is meant to be patterned after Wynwood. The VC itself is meant to be patterned after Wynwood. Uh, it looks like a two-story structure. I mean, it is a two-story structure. But the upstairs is pseudo. There's nothing going on up there. It's a huge waste of space, which I pointed out when I was in maintenance, to which they said, hey, man, go over there and do some work. <laughs> um, so this is my office. This is the clerk. Three office, clerk two office. Uh, we have uh, backstock in here. But basically, this is all open upstairs here. And if you go in there and you look up, there's a T like this kind of. So there's an upstairs above my office and an upstairs above the kitchen. But uh, this could easily be turned into something over here. There's the air handlers are up there, outdoor restrooms uh, for visitation. Um, and then the parking and all that is over here. So uh, that's what it's meant to mimic and look like, and uh, more could be done with it if need be. It does have a nice back porch on it, rocking chairs all across there. I drove to somewhere across Plains and picked up a load of those rockers to uh, cable up to the back porch, and they were special built for us. And uh, they get used here and there, not as often as I'd like, but um, nice back porch to sit out and look at the deer that often come out and hang out right there. All right, so these are our interpreted displays inside. You kind of saw some through the conference room slide there a minute ago. So all total here, uh, seven. And so this is what I was talking about earlier, whereas Bledsoe Creek in and of itself is not super historical, but the surrounding entities are. So if any of you have been out and visited these things, you know, there's a lot to see, a lot to learn out there. Or you can just come to our office, stand in the lobby for 15 to 30 minutes, and read these things. My wife goes through them in 15 minutes. I stand and read every word and I'm more like the 30 minute version. So uh, a lot of interesting facts can be learned here and we've got a couple of display cases. Here's the corner of one of them. These didn't used to be there. They actually came from Long Hunter State Park. Boss man was going to get rid of them over there. So I said, hey, you still got those display cases? So we got a lot of the Long Hunter uh, equipment and clothing in these display cases. And then there's one more around the corner um, kind of leaning towards the back door, that is the more the natural effect. We got fossils, different types of bones, and things of that nature in that one. So that's what you will find in the visitor center lobby. And here's our displays. The bottom right over here giving you the long hunter effect. Top left, got your uh, great horned owl, some deer skulls, deer antlers, turkey feathers, things of that nature. My first geo. Right there. Uh, cut it on the rocks off at Tennessee Tech. So uh, <laughs> the assistant there, right, teacher's aide, said, we're going to go to Jackson County and start looking for some geos. Anybody want in? I said, I can go get you a whole truckload of geos. Like, yeah, right, Thurman. Anybody want in on Jackson County? So you know, a couple weeks went by. I said, uh, I'm going to go collect some geos. And uh, we had a geo club meeting coming up. I said, uh, so at the end of that meeting, I'll have my truck. Can we have everybody come out and help unload them? And they again scoffed at me. Said, yeah, okay, sure. We'll come out and get your 12 GMs. So I went out to where my wife is from, Clay County area. And the guy two doors down from her mother um, has all filled full of them. And if anybody knows what a geo is, they're, they're absolute terror on implements and tractors. <laughs> so he more than happy to get some people drag them out of his, out of his ditch line and field and such. So I went and loaded up my truck and took them up there. And after the meeting, I said, ah, oh, what? The geodes. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Thurman, why don't you come get some geodes out of his truck? And sure enough, for the next 30 minutes, we had a whole line of people carrying geodes into uh, Kitra Hall, actually known as the Rock Lodge. And then Dr. Limer, one of my favorite professors up there, uh, said that the building tilted on its foundation <laughs> when they got it all unloaded and into the building. So anyway, I proudly display it there, a story that very rarely will get mentioned. <laughs> did you find the one, excuse me, that's yes, huge, 
huge that's in the lobby? Uh, that one actually was a Christmas present to Mr. Brooks. I did find that one that did come from that trip. That was a, and that's amazing. I handpicked some for, for Christmas gifts that one year. Yes, ma'am. So that one uh, Mr. Brooks took with him. I think Paul left his. Okay. But it wasn't such the specimen. Yeah. I saved the biggest and best for the boss, man. Yeah. <laughs> I know which one you're talking about. He took it with him. Uh, so this is Allison, uh, my other clerk, Clerk 2. She's in charge of and runs and sits in the office with the gift shop. Um, the gift shop uh, is something that has kind of come on, kind of when I was there before, it was just getting started, it just had some medallions and hiking stick medallions and pins and such. So now we've actually got shirts and the like, and marketing has come a long way with Tennessee State Parks. Um, we're trying to get a lot of things that are branded and have our own name on it, not just Tennessee State Parks, but Bledsoe Creek State Park. So um, there's some items here in the picture, I'd be happy to explain what we do and don't offer if you have questions. but. Uh, it's constantly changing, and I'm constantly asking, hey, our mission, our park mission is this, and we need to get these type of items in here to sell in the gift shop and things like that. So we're constantly getting new things in. Uh, matter of fact, in this corner here, I'm getting ready to hang uh, a, a black pipe hanging type of deal structure to be able to hang out the shirts and better display them and all that. So it's constantly in flux, and there'll be things, some things have changed, and it may not look like that next time you guys see it. But gift shop, as soon as you walk in the door on the left. Actually, will be to your right, sliding glass window. All right, so here's my Ranger, Jennifer Smith. This is her vehicle. So if you ever see that giant white GMC or, or Chevy, I think it is, um, you know that that's Jennifer most days. Um, so she's in charge of programming out there, the interpretive effort. She will direct, well, she does directly supervise the two clerks. Um, she will also supervise the SIR, which we talked about right in the beginning. Um, in years past. All of our SIRs have been uh, typically uh, science oriented. This time we're going to get a, a fella, his name is Jacob Cleese, and he is from MTSU, and he is more geared towards uh, the historical aspect. So we're going to have him doing uh, some reenactments and dressing as Long Hunter and more Indian mm -hmm. and um, giving different historical aspect programs. But he's al he also is interested in the science stuff, so we're not going to deviate from that. This is our resident snake, corn snake. Mr. Slithers, he, uh, he lives in Jennifer's office. Jennifer is one of these types of individuals that's cold on the equator. I myself am hot like right now. So, um, it's a funny story. Back in the winter, <laughs> my thermostat controls my office and Ashley's office. Jennifer's thermostat controls her office and the kitchen. So, one morning, Ashley could see her breath because I refused to turn my thermostat in that direction. So they came in on a weekend when I wasn't working and opened up my door and punched up my thermostat to make it comfortable in there, which I said, of course, dude, I told them anytime you get cold, bump it up. So anyway, uh, the, the office in her, her domain there stays super hot all the time, mainly because of the snake, but also for her. <laughs> um, and then you have uh, her out on a hiking expedition here, one of her programs. So that's my ranger. Um, should be working most of the weekends and does all the programming. So if you have anybody in mind, any special outings you want to do, you can call the park office and we can arrange for special programs to be given. Yeah. All right, so I mentioned campground hosts earlier. Uh, I have another pair, to be honest, that I don't know, I'm not familiar with. They have stayed with us and camped with us before. They're currently residing in Florida, and they're going to be here, uh, should be May 13th. And we'll have a total of six when they get here. But these, these are long stay. They've been there a long time. Tommy, this is Mr. Tommy and Miss Lois. This is Mr. and Ms. Gross, Wandell and Ron Gross. Um, Tommy was there when I showed up my very first day. I came into the little 500 inch square shack and I said, hey, I'm looking for Mr. Brooks. And they said, hey, he's in there, what can I do for you? And when I looked around, uh, it was Tommy. And he, he's a jack of all trades. He can run the office, he can run the lawnmower, he can run the tractor, he can run the chainsaw. He does any and everything. He's had a million jobs, so it seems to me. When he starts talking about this and that, he's done. So um, he's the guy always riding around. They both have golf carts. But they'll be riding around in golf carts. They give you your wood, your ice, anything you might need. you got a problem with your water, problem with your electric. Um, Tommy can work on all that stuff. Mr. Gross retired from Nissan and also had a landscaping slash construction business. So he runs a backhoe to sleep. So I, am, I have the best four known out there, in my opinion. Uh, they can do anything I ask of them and, and often work. Over their hours, they're, again, not paid. They're on a volunteer effort. They're meant to work 20 hours per couple. 
and they do way more than that, Colby. Um, so, like I said, these are friendly faces. Uh, should you need anything while you're out at the park, memorize these faces, and they'll be happy to help you just the same as the staff. Uh, this is our conservation worker. This is a position that I was in once upon a time, seasonal. Then they call you a conservation worker, which is a fancy name for maintenance man. <laughs> um, so that's the maintenance shop. So if you're coming down Deer Run, which is our first campground road, you'll come through this parking lot and out the other side and drive through the one-way street I mentioned earlier through the uh, primitive section. Um, and this is a giant chipper, about an $84,000 machine that we had on loan from Pinson Mountain State Park. Uh, something that I ran when I was back there as a seasonal and again in, a, in an attempt to get the park cleaned up and looking kind of back like it used to. I've got the chipper back on site, and uh, Mr. Tim Poole is the manager over there. Pinson Mounds, very generous to us, nice guy, and has got it on loan for us to be able to get some areas cleaned up. So that's pretty much the staff. And now we're going to talk about a few of the initiatives that uh, has been pushed down, be it, from, be it from the governor or the director of state parks, his name's Mike Robertson. So we have this Go Green initiative, and uh, essentially, in a nutshell, it's this. Um, you go through and try to check out any loss of energy or lack of efficiency that you have in the park. So in other words, going to all LEDs for your lighting, for example, uh, occupancy sensors on the bathrooms, things of that nature, automatic flushes on the commodes, sinks, automatic uh, water dispenser, things of that nature, and you are ranked and are tallying so many points, and you're supposed to re receive either a bronze, a silver, or a gold uh, stamp of approval, so to speak. Um, Mr. Brooks is really good on that kind of thing, but for whatever reason, they missed it last year. Um, so we reevaluated, we redid, and got things what we feel to be up to snuff. If our points add up and are accepted, uh, we're in the silver range by a few points at this point. Um, but that audit, which I said audit in front of the, the nice lady that came to do it, and she was like, no, no, this is an evaluation. No, no, no. <laughs> for whatever reason, she was offended by that. I didn't mean to say something wrong there. So anyway, she came and went through and, and actually found more points than what we had accounted for. So, uh, I, I won't know anything until May. There are two individuals that will sit and evaluate uh, this data across all 56 state parks. It's going to take some time. So I hope to learn something in May, but I hope to be up to specs. Uh, we have these things called IPPs um, that you set certain work, work outcomes. And on there, everybody is, all parks are meant to gain at least the bronze initiative in this particular uh, outcome. So, uh, because of that, you will find many places across the park that have uh, what they call bear savers, these green metal cans that are made in triplicate, and they are, they used to say trash, I don't know why they put trash, we ripped it off and put plastic and aluminum on there. So, use these receptacles whenever you can. Uh, all bathrooms have it, there's actually some at that residence, even though nothing's really going on there. Any and all places that people might be, we have receptacles set out there for recycling, and that only helps us gain points to go towards this Go Green initiative. All right, so this is something that they put out this year. <clears throat> so, do you need guys go out with your smartphone and take pictures and try to identify stuff? <laughs> or with a trifold and try to identify stuff, right? This is something that you can do for me if you're into that kind of stuff and help me build my database out at the park. So, it's called iNaturalist. And it's something you can go in and it's supported with the iPhone. So you can get that out of the App Store. Put it on there and then you can go around and just click pictures. And you can try to identify it. It'll give you some suggested species that it might be. Or others can chime in and readily identify it. So when that happens and it's confirmed, then it gets added to my database because it's GPSing you and it knows where you're at and you're in the park boundaries. And so it adds to my database and it's something that's new and the GIS Folks downtown, her name's Sunny Fleming. She's all geeked out about it, and she's rushing it to us. Any and all GIS data stuff that she can do, um, she's put it out to the parks. And uh, you can help me build my database if you go on and get that app and start entering data. All right, Healthy Parks, Healthy Person, another initiative this year. It's a great initiative. Um, here are some flyers for that. So the way I presented this at my uh, New Year's Day hike was like, does anybody like free stuff? <laughs> I like some free stuff. Everybody likes free stuff. So the way this is, and it's kind of on an honor system, which benefits you, the, the participant. So what it is, is you come out, and, and again, this is an app, okay? And you go in, and you can do these things like take a walk, ride a bike, that kind of thing, any kind of exertion in a park. And it doesn't have to be my park. 
because I've partnered with Triple Creek, I've partnered with uh, Hendersonville Parks, and all of the Galaxy Parks, which is Triple Creek, I should say. And uh, Mr. Dave Brown, and everybody's got it out, posted, so you should see some more of these things out at the city parks as well. So what you do is you show up, you do an activity, and you claim points off of it. Then when you get so many points, you can redeem those points. And this is where it's good for them. You can go to city parks if you're closer to there, it's just where you used to go and whatever, and gain your points. But you can come to our gift shop, or to our campground, or to sometimes a cat if you don't offer caddies, and redeem your points. Of course, you've got to have so many points in order to get a free round of golf, in order to get a sweatshirt, or something like that. But those points can be accrued by logging in and getting these points accrued on your app. Um, the reason why it's still on the honor system is because it's not following you GPS-wise. Any part, in order to be able to do this, and here's some examples of the rewards. Um, you know, some, some state parks have restaurants, so you can get some meals that way. You can sign up for a program that would normally cost money. We have some fee-based programming going on that they're pushing really hard in state parks. Any of these things here, again, it's all self-explanatory here. And you can't really see it very well, it's kind of grainy, but it'll tell you how many points you need to get to a certain redemption. Right? So healthy parks of the person. And if you want to know more about it, again, feel free to take these. That's why Rob, they're all up here for you guys to take. So, nature packs. This is a great idea that my clerk three actually came up with along with Jennifer. Um, they put together these type of things. It tells you what the pack concludes there, binoculars, compass, field guides. And at the moment, we have three of them. We're willing to put together many more of that if, if need be. And uh, it's going to be the whole supply and demand effect. Um, so currently, we have three of them. Meant to kind of be like mom brings her kids out for a hike. You can get, gather these things, check them out, so to speak, and uh, go out and observe with them, and then bring them back to the office when you're done. So uh, something that we're trying to get to catch on, uh, I think it will become more popular when school's out and we have more kids in the park. So, you know, the idea is next year, if they become really popular, we have a dozen of them and they're a dollar to rent out, that kind of thing. It's yeah. kind of where we hope to get to. Mm -hmm. But for now, the nature packs are free and can be had at the uh, office. Security gate. Um, so again, because of the number of people on staff that are law enforcement, which is just two of us, myself and the ranger. Um, Mr. Brooks thought it would be a good idea to put in this gate. Uh, I want to say $16,000 rings a bell to me. Um, great thing to have. It basically shuts down at a certain time to disallow people entry into the park. Cuts down on people that shouldn't be there, right? Mm -hmm. The only way to get in after hours, which is either five or seven, as I mentioned earlier, is to have a gate code. Um, the only problem I've seen since I've been back is that uh, people like to back into it. <laughs> so, you know, you pull up to the gate here, and you can back straight into the parking lot and then take off, just like this car is doing. However, they back into there, which is into here, and they smack it. And so, on two separate occasions, I found, you know, taillight lenses and things out there. But all I did the first time was curl that. The second time, I found a lot of lens, and this whole, what they call a gooseneck, is leaned over like that. And uh, consequently, it stopped working about the week after, which is when we started having all those floods and uh, rains and floods in February. So I got out the welder and the bender, and I bent up that pipe, and I welded that face mask around it <laughs> after I took the tractor and pulled it back up right. So uh, we've gotten it fixed, we've gotten it protected, and hopefully it's going to stay that way. And um, a great thing to kind of access a third uh, ranger, if you will. Uh, emergency access gates. So this is the Harsh property for those of you that are familiar with the area and the people that own things around here. So this is directly north of us. This gate can be seen from the VC actually. And there's three others, so we have a total of four gates. There used to be three. Sorry, I keep stepping in the way. It's okay. Talking. That's rude. I'm sorry. Can you see? Okay. So uh, up at the very top of the High Ridge Trail, uh, it's about 120 foot in elevation. In the summer of 2014, I redid all 72, now 71 steps. So I know it's 120 foot in elevation because I had to carry buckets of rock up that incline to redo these steps. Um, so up there at the very top, there's no access and it's very tight with a gator. I can maneuver it. Jennifer's not so good at it though. So we needed to get a fourth gate cut in and I dealt with the harsh boys and allowed, uh, they allowed me access to put in a fourth gate. So now, which you may or may not be able to make out, uh, all gates are numbered, and we have lat long on them. And then on the other side, 
We have uh, ag implement triangle, you know, reflective uh, signs. So that way you can see them from the other side. So should there be an emergency, you take the gator to this first gate, which is across from the DC, and you drive through the pasture and come through gate four if there's an emergency on the high risk trail. Um, we've had a couple things going up there since I've been back. Um, there's a particular walking group that comes out on Tuesdays typically. We had a man who had a heart issue up there. Turned out to be fine. But Jennifer, this is prior to this fourth gate getting cut in. Jennifer had to maneuver the gator all the way up there and collect him and then kind of bounce him back down. So it wasn't a pleasant ride for him. Luckily, you know, he, everything worked out fine. And the other was a, uh, a lady came out who self-professed that she goes to all state parks even in her not best shape and hikes these trails. And she went out on this monsoon and got about halfway up the High Ridge Trail and couldn't get up and couldn't get down because it was so muddy. She ended up on all fours. Tommy actually went up there on the gator and strapped a rope to her and pulled her up the grade and got her the gator. But these gates are essential and that's something that I've got done since I've been back. i um, got them numbered and labeled and the signage and all that to make them readily visible. Uh, there were people there either in the campground host capacity or on staff that didn't know where they were at or how to get to them or any of that. So, uh, medical and emergency response wise, I've, I've tried to improve that. Uh, speaking of improvements, trail improvements, and I've kind of talked about this a little bit. So, this is an example of a three and a half incher that you'll find out on the various trail systems. This is on Birdsong Trail, which is the orange in color. Uh, this being the uh, high ridge and shoreline, which is red at the moment. Um, so, here's the infamous set of steps, the infamous set of steps that I redid. In 2014, so a couple of them are needed. This was all twisted, pretty much every one of them when I was there as a seasonal. And so as you can see, a couple of them have uh, started to turn that way again. It needs to be addressed again. Um, coming up, sometime down the road, I've, I've basically gotten a grant. REI is a company that does outfitting, outdoor outfitting, and they gave us a $5,000 grant. Uh, I can't take total claim for it. it. It actually was procured prior to me getting there. Then the friends group said, hey, we got this grant. What do you want to do with it? I was like, I thought that was already established. No, no, here's the money. What are you going to do? So what we've done is we've bought a lot of equipment to be able to bore into the rocks. You don't see a lot of rock in this picture because this is at the bottom. But when you go on up and get up higher, you'll have a lot of rock outcroppings. So I bought some equipment, rock hammers and things of that nature, uh, rock boring bits, to be able to install a handrail system. So again, if anybody's familiar, when you're coming down this, and it's slick, you're looking at the lake uh, from 120 foot up. So it can be dangerous, particularly under certain conditions. Um, now that was something that Mr. Brooks and I talked about when I was a seasonal about getting some kind of a rope up there, something to hang on to in, in dodgy situations. So um, I can't say as to when it's gonna happen. Mr. David Brown over at Triple Creek Parks has donated the pipe. It's sitting on the trailer. It's just had to go get it and bend it and weld it and cut it, get all that stuff done. Um, and then the manpower to get it in the ground, that's going to be the most difficult part. So um, I will probably wait till my seasonal help comes in this summer and try to work towards that initiative. But uh, we are working on the blazing, which is on your left, and also the high ridge trail will we'll get some attention hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, while we're talking about seasonals, uh, one position I left out earlier. <clears throat> for the first time ever, we've been granted hours for what they call a seasonal commissioned officer. So Jennifer and I will get uh, help in the law enforcement aspect, as well as being able to double up some of the shifts on the weekend. So currently how it works is either she works the weekend or I work the weekend. There's just one of us. Um, with it getting dark later, you really need somebody to work later on into the night. So this gentleman, his name's Ryan Martin, worked out perfectly. Um, you have to have a four-year degree to be uh, law enforcement with Tennessee State Parks, be a ranger or be a manager. So a lot of your city cops, county deputies, and things of that nature do not have a four-year degree, so they're out immediately. But it just so happened I'm in contact with Sergeant Greer, who heads up the SRO program in schools. And uh, Ryan Martin is an SRO at White House Middle School, and he came highly recommended by multiple people before I even made contact with him. And he has an elementary education degree works right in, he does some reenacting, works right in. So I got very, very lucky in the fact that he's got the summers off being an SRO officer as opposed to just another type of law enforcement officer. And he has the degree, that is being elementary education, and he happens to do reenacting. So that gentleman will be joining us uh, May 19th, and uh, he's somebody that we're really lucky to have. Um, we've never had one before.
So I'll be able to work a double shift uh, on the weekends and get more uh, coverage on the park patrol wise. All right, and here's a little bit of the primitive. So this is the original right hand side. Currently they're all lettered, they're all about letters, whereas everything else is numbers. So we have A through H here. I will show up at the end of that, coming shortly, and then we'll follow out the rest of the alphabet on the other side. So this is original, what I did back in 2015. This is what we've accomplished now last fall. The same type of pull-throughs, if you can see that. Um, there'll be all total. What's currently open and, and can be occupied right now is four pull-throughs for a total of eight primitives. We're going to add one more on that side. There'll be five on this side. So when it's all said and done, there'll be five pull-throughs with amenities sometime down the road. Um, but for now, we're trying to get some grass to grow there. You can barely tell. This was this morning with all the fog. Took that one this morning. And we've got some straw out there. We're trying to get some grass to grow before we start opening it up to people. And we'll get the uh, grills and <clears throat> fire rings and picnic tables and all that installed before we open it up to the public. But that's the primitive setup, and, and this is a little closer view of it down here as to where it might fall on the map. All right, butterfly garden. So, uh, UT Master Gardeners have come in and helped me with this. We talked about this. Um, so I've been in contact with Miss Janice. To be honest, I don't know her last name. It's just Miss Janice. Um, so she's come out from uh, the UT Extension and looked at this plot. Again, this is right next to the VC, as you can see. Um, this is just a plot of the grass that was left here um, after the build. And the problem I had with it, Mr. Brooks had with it, was people were constantly turning in here and running off into it. And right after the build, everything was real soft. There was giant ruts. So really, every Monday morning, I'd have to come out there with their shovel and with their rake and fill in these ruts. <laughs> Finally, I said to him, hey, boss man, we've got to do something about this. They're, they're going to destroy it over and over. Nothing's going to grow, blah, blah, blah. So I built this cedar fence uh, in December, right before I left, I guess. Um, and then after the fact, <clears throat> one of the groups that come out and do a lot of reenactments and kind of head up the Tennessee History Trail effect, uh, it's called the Middle Tennessee History Coalition. They came in and built this structure. They meant to do programming and such under it. Um, not a whole lot does go on there. So, I put in a butterfly garden. So, uh, there's a little bit of rock in there. My campground host with the back, backhoe is going to come out and dig out the rock. We're going to till it up. And, uh, matter of fact, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, I am meeting Miss Janice at 12 Corners to procure some plants and try to get some stuff going. Um, so, there'll be some stuff in that picture. Uh, within the so hopefully the idea is to get it up to par within the next couple of uh, years and won't the deer just love that stuff right so that was a topic of conversation <laughs> good point and so um, you know we brainstormed on two three ways to try to keep them out uh, be it natural be it more fencing different type of fencing so we're going to do the best we can but yes it would definitely be an issue um, anything short to the ground and sweet like that, they'll just gobble up. Um, but I don't want it to be so unesthetically pleasing either, so um, you could be a real tall fence, but then you couldn't see the plants. Um, there's two or three things we're going to try. But yes, you're exactly right. <laughs> the deer will have a feast if I don't do it just right. Um, and here's Paddle Easy, we've been discussing before. This is the type of contraption that they implore. A little digital keypad here. And uh, the boats themselves, the vessels themselves, <laughs> if it works out, again, I don't know if any other bids have been put in, and so I've been in direct contact with Kyle Easy and had their uh, contact come out. So I'm supposed to get six double seating kayaks and two paddle boards. Um, so uh, this is the contraption that they're attached to. So the vessels themselves are cabled, the oars or paddles sit in a little slot, and when you open that door that allows you access to the paddle, as well as the uh, PFD, personal flotation device, that is inside of the cabinet. Um, so again, all self-contained. Self um, they can run off of plug-in power, or they come with uh, Wi-Fi and a photo cell. So I'm going the latter route, um, where they're going to be placed. They're going to be placed near the back boat ramp, and uh, we'll sit on a little bench there next to the uh, back boat ramp, if and when they get put in place. So again, uh, the last. Advertisement should have ran on 4-2, so I should be hearing something any time now. And so again, by the time school's out, maybe I hope to have something out there for people to take advantage of. Uh, this is our programming calendar. I'm not going to go through all of this, but this just kind of gives you an idea of what we're offering in the various different months. 
Um, I'll talk about a couple things that are coming up. Um, in years past, we've offered an Easter egg deal. And uh, this year, we're going to deviate from that a little bit, and we're going to do uh, photos with the Easter Bunny. Uh, much like we did photos with Santa last Christmas. Um, we've got the suit. Uh, Mr. Tommy will be the bunny, just like he is Santa. I can't wait to see how that's going to unfold. Um, my mother-in-law had to augment the suit a couple different times to make sure it's going to fit him. So anyway, uh, we'll see how that turns out. That's this coming weekend, the 13th. I believe the time is from 1 to 4 at the park uh, office in the conference room. Um, so we've got that coming up. Uh, the following weekend, the 20th of April, uh, that's my weekend to work, and that's also the weekend we're hosting the uh, Earth Day celebration. Right here is kind of where we're at if you're keeping up. Buddy pictures, Earth Day celebration. So we're going to have natural areas, which a lot of people confuse just for another state park, but natural areas and state parks are like sister entities. Um, they don't always do the same things. Um, they'll be there. TWRA will be there. Um, Stormwater will be there. We've got the uh, composting guy coming. A lot of different entities. Games, activities, things of that nature. Uh, we'll be dedicating a uh, water bottle filling station that day, um, which is on the next slide, I guess. Briefly jump up there. So there's the flyer for the Earth Day and this water bottle filling station. Um, something that I thought we probably should have. A lot of people pop into the office and ask for it. And so when I said to the friends group, they got their ducks in a row, there's been some turnover in there, but People got in place, things were headed in the right direction, started making a little money, these are some differences in how they did things. So I said, hey, can you guys buy me that? They said, we'll vote on it. So they did, and so we got it. And uh, matter of fact, I've been out collecting some equipment today to, to purchase to get it installed. So, where will that be? Okay, so on the outside of the VC, between the two restrooms. Okay. Uh, I got water access there, I'm gonna poke through uh, from basically the sink area on the men's okay. side. Um, I'm kind of OCD, and I really, really, really wanted it to be in the middle. But due to what's going on inside that little boy, it's not going to be. It's going to be slightly offset to the right. <laughs> so uh, I'm ecstatic to have it. Um, I think a lot of people will use it, and I'll never even know it because it's outside, and there it is, and they're hiking, and fill up their bottle, and off they go. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Randall Carter, vice president over here at the bank, at Citizens Bank, uh, he's going to donate some water bottles, and he'll be out there, and he'll have his gleaming smile in the picture with us. So that's coming up in two weekends' time. Go back a minute. So uh, again, various things happen across the, the calendar, but a couple things just to point out. Um, Tennessee East Patrol event, it's a, it's a big event we try to promote. Uh, all stations will be filled with reactors. They like to They like to get about 15 to 20 people in a group, and they'll take you to each station. And we'll have reenactors, people demonstrating, talking, telling you things about that particular time period. It lasts about 15, 20 minutes per station. And at the end of it, we typically have like a little uh, bonfire, fire pit kind of area. And last year we tried eats and drinks. It didn't work so well. The weather wasn't very good, but we may try that again. But anyway, it's uh, kind of set up as a Friday-Saturday deal, whereas uh, homeschool groups and other public school groups can come out on the Friday. And then Saturday is kind of like just general public. You can come out either day, of course. But that's something big that we do in November. The Trunk or Treat is put on by our friends group. We always have just mass boards of people come out for that. Uh, last year, we parked everybody in every little spare inch of space that we could get. It just so happened. Let's see, how did that go? Um, I think it was put on from like 6.30, 8.30 or 6 to 8. It just so happened by about 7.30, people were getting through and getting back to the cars and getting out to allow more parking to be had. It was that packed. Um, so it's always a big turnout. My wife and I are big Halloween people. We got married on Halloween, so I try to love this one. <laughs> so uh, Parker Treat's always a big deal. The History Trail, I'm trying to get to be a big deal. Um, then probably the Santa thing is probably the next most important thing. Picks with Santa went really well last year. Um, they kind of differed, again, changed how they did it as far as what they were charging and what you got, this and that. So. Uh, again, you can check our website when it gets closer to time, and you can <clears throat> get an inside look at what we're going to offer, what dates we're going to offer it, but there at least is one with 7th to the 14th, there'll be a hike. So we're changing up with s'mores around the fire pit, that went well this, this past year. So again, we're deviating, differing things a little bit, but if you're used to coming out to the park for certain events, mainly they're still going to be there, they just be a little different. So um, that's a look at our calendar, what goes on. There's a couple other things on there. Any questions about the calendar? 
Water bulb fill station, things of that nature. Uh, we were talking about that. Oh yeah, here's my vintage Jeep show coming up, May 11th. So, uh, I'm into old Jeeps. I got a bunch of them, and they're the type that have like things that attach to them and do work. Um, so I'll put them out there on display. I got several other people bringing uh, stuff to the show. Uh, you can look online for if you want to try to bring a Jeep or a tractor. Um, Ten dollars for the first entry, five dollars for the second. But uh, we'll, we'll put on a little display and, and food and games and things like that will be there for that day. Coming up on May 11th. That's me putting in post call over there with the Jeep. <laughs> Tennessee History Trail, we talked about this a minute ago. So this is Rob Lanier. He's the president of the Middle Tennessee History Coalition. This is the fur trading cabin as it was going up. That's right about the time that I left to go to Long Hunter. I was there for the four walls and kind of started on the roof. There it is, finished. That's at station three. Uh, here's Tim McKay. He is at the Long Hunter Half Shelter talking to a group about what Long Hunters did. And this has become really popular. I don't know, some of you may have even been out for this. This is a tomahawk throwing demo. And so kids come out, adults come out, everybody comes out. You pay 10 bucks and just throw tomahawks until your arm gets tired. And then you go. <laughs> so uh, people are re reenacting this or dressed up. Um, it's a pretty fun event, you know. People like to get out there and they get a run and start and they as hard as possible. They go, and they're like, no, 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 you need to do it like this. And then, so they give you technique and how to throw it and how to be accurate with it. So it's a good time and, uh, you know, it's family friendly. And we got a lot of people on scene to make sure safety is addressed and all that kind of stuff. So that's a little bit about the history effect that's going on with the park. Sand in the park we mentioned a while ago. And you can probably find me in that picture. You look really hard. Um, but Santa does a, Santa, Tommy does a great job as Santa. Mm -hmm. And um, kids, you know, love to come and get their picture made. This is my wife, bottom left, as an elf. Uh, <laughs> and I'm in there, too, if you want to talk about me. But uh, that s'mores up there with Tommy in the top left uh, around the fire. That went really well this year as well. Uh, friends group information. Just like you got a friends group here at the library, this is our friends group. They, do, they support the Bass and Buddies. They support the Trunk or Tree. Um, this is them splitting wood and bundling all that up. And here are prices that are associated with your membership. Um, I have handouts of that up here if you're interested in that, becoming a member of the Friends Group. I have those here if you'd like to take those home with you and consider that. But uh, again, there's been a little bit of turnover and, and, and things are getting done more and often and better and, and uh, it's just it's turning, turning out to be a good thing. So if you want to be a part of this and come out and work on trails or help split wood or just there's a, a gamut of things that you come out and help and do. So if you'd be happy, to, if you'd be uh, helpful enough to pass the word, that would really help us out out there. And then there's our contact information, um, phone number, park office hours, website, my card. I also have cards up here for myself. If you want to take those on your way out, um, that's the Over Sellers Farm, which is the satellite extension of Long Hunter. That was an Eagle Scout project in which he uh, mm -hmm. built new boats for me to put out in this field for a self-guided tour. One through 13 posts for a self-guided tour. <clears throat> a couple things that I didn't mention that are up here. If you're interested in the other 55 state parks besides Bloodsoak Creek, this is the one you want. Uh, it's probably the most helpful for the fact that when you open it up, it'll show you a little bit about what's going on in East, Middle, and West Tennessee. And then, furthermore, and then a little blurb about all of them as you open it up, more of that. But what's really cool is right here, if you want to go somewhere for camping, it tells you specifically what they offer as far as camping or cabins or water access and things of that nature. So it kind of details all 56 state parks and what they have to offer. So that's up here for you guys. Um, <clears throat> This is just the general park map for us out here at Bledsoe. Um, campground map is up here. And then the last thing I'll talk about here real briefly is like, a lot of people get miffed about the wood thing. So there's a big mandated firewood policy. So the deal is the Emerald Ash Borer, for those of you that may be familiar, is really wreaking havoc. It's moving this way. And people carry wood from A to B and they don't realize they're carrying bugs, as we would just openly refer to them, but certain insects inhabit these pieces of wood, and then when you bring them to the park from your house, be it down the street or be it from 50 miles away, uh, it's just a transportation 
deal, right? You, you, you allow them a vehicle to get to our park. So that's why we have heat treated firewood that you may buy elsewhere. Tractor Supply sells it, I think Lowe's sells it. There are various entities. As long as you bring heat treated firewood to my park, I'm good. Um, or you buy our firewood that is harvested off of the park, we're good. So if you're interested on what types of organisms can get transported from A to B, this is the pamphlet you want and it explains everything that goes on with the policy. So that's awesome. I hope I answered y'all's questions or told you a little bit of something that maybe I hope it is more like that.